Welcome back, everyone. It's time for more Disco Elysium. Now, last time we started looking for Ruby, found and began studying a piece of the armor, bought some high-potency alcohol for god only knows what reason, and enlisted a crack team of hobos to sabotage Everhart's plans for the village. It was quite the day, and we're not even halfway through it. Off camera, I sold a few things and stopped us right in front of Everhart's office, so we'll start by clearing that quest and finding out where the hell our gun went. We'll also drop that stuffed bird off for guard and resume our pursuit of Ruby further up the coast. Alright, big fella. You ready to talk, or do we need to shred a few documents for you, too? Mr. Dubois, every worker, member of the board, how can I help you today? I noticed this before. There's a small delay before his greeting actually plays. Naturally, he's grateful for our acts of henchmanry, and he seems unaware of our cunning plan of ask some drunks to sign the paperwork instead. Necktie is impressed. For once, it feels like we got the upper hand here. Let's just keep it under our hat and get what we can out of him. He's still putting on the air of altruism says the plan is to build affordable housing downtown for the people he drives out of the fishing village. How generous of him. The lieutenant knows what that means for the village. You'll note he gives no indication of how we actually solve the quest. There's no esprit de corps check or knowing look, even though he was there when we got them signed. Everett's no longer talking like just a mobbed-up union leader. He's acting more like a mayor, someone who plans to remake Martinez, his way. Tearing down all the ruins and finally rebuild from the war. Taking this district back, as he says. And he seems pretty far along in his plans, too. Now, he's as greasy as any politician, but his men follow him for a reason. Empathy thinks the anger in his voice is real backed by pain. But reaction speed sees the rub. The plan puts the Clare brothers straight at the top when it's all said and done. And there's something else real in his words and body language whenever he talks about Joyce. There's anger there, too. He genuinely hates her. Finally, we get some truth out of him. He admits his men didn't kill the mercenary. It's not the whole story, though. He acts like he'd have to do it himself, but we know he could have given the order. He does, however, freely admit he's exploiting the man's death, using it to effectively start a war with Wild Pines. He's not at all worried about the mercenaries. They're badly outnumbered and deeply unpopular, even with the people who send them. The real war is in the ideas and statements open defiance of the coalition. The strike is just the opening act. Manana and Leo outside suggested as much, but here it is from the horse's mouth. The dock is being taken over, completely. Everard doesn't swear often, and he means it when he does. That's why the standoff with Joyce, and why he ran off the previous negotiator. He wants the conflict because he's sure he's going to win it, no matter the cost. He acts all chummy with us now, but he doesn't even mind if we tell her. He's practically daring us to. He insists he has no idea who killed the mercenary. The reaction speed picks up that he thinks it's a guy. Maybe just a guess. To be fair, we have no real idea either at this point. With over 2,300 men, Logic says the Dock Workers Union is one of the larger ones in the city, and they're motivated to boot. Everard isn't making idle threats here. He really thinks he's bringing communism back to Revishol. It won't be that simple, of course. The Docks need business, and business doesn't like disruption. But Everard seems pretty sure most clients will continue to work with them. He also seems to think community stake in the Docks would give the men a shot in the arm. The big tell, however, is in these bold, exotic new revenue streams. Drug trafficking. 
A harbor can move a lot of raw materials. He claims they're from legit chemical factories, all for the purpose of legit pharmaceutical contracts, and he could very well mean this. There's no way to know for sure. What we do know is Wild Pines avoided bulk shipping of these chemicals, and the Dock Workers Union will not. There are noble ends here, or so he says, but we're not talking about socializing the medical industry, we're talking about taking over the shipping. Funny. For a communist, Mr. Clare makes one hell of a capitalist. Note the use of suppositions, the word if, still playing coy. If there were a drug trade, he'd mostly be worried about the union getting his cut. And again, he avoids directly answering the question. Recall that Ruby is part of an extensive smuggling operation. Something is off about this. He knows that even if Harry was dirty as hell, Kim certainly isn't, and wouldn't ignore even a hypothetical drug trade. Why bring this up at all? He keeps trying to go back to the big picture, talking about Martinez as a whole, turning it into some kind of socialist commune, a lofty goal. Volition wants to focus on the drugs. He was close to just saying it. And like that, the drugs are off the table, acting like it's easily discarded. I'll just bet. The politics of it are one thing, but none of these options point to the elephant in the room. Or rather, the man in front of us. I specifically don't trust him, and he has to consider the possibility that we wouldn't. Composure picks up on the change in him. He certainly seems more alive than he did a minute ago. But enough of this. We did all this to get our gun back, and it turns out he's known where it was for the last two days. Of course the son of a bitch did. He says an older woman has our gun. Logic recognizes the one Roy was talking about, the one he seemed nervous about. For someone wanting to be helpful, he sure does relish twisting the knife. So this lady has our gun, and she's been waving it around at people, and she's quite possibly deranged. Fan-fucking-tastic. Yeah, this is a shit show. We need to find this woman, fast. And she calls herself the Pigs. This does not bode well for her mental stability. Kim's poker face is getting a workout today. I'm not clear how he set up a meeting with a crazy person, but eh, whatever. Tonight at 2200, 10 p.m., down by the fish market. Ten hours from now is our chance to unfuck this. Yeah, fun stuff indeed. Let's get out of here. It's been a real barrel of laughs, Everard. Have fun building the community center. Come on, Kim. Sucker. Uh, I guess I can't say that too much. He got us to do some work for him. Still, we got what we needed. The rest was... enlightening. But how much of that can we take at face value? I think he's telling us all this for a reason. He's acting like a Bond villain who was about to give the game away, but I don't get the impression he makes those kind of mistakes. So yeah, I have questions about what we just witnessed. First, gonna put a point in endurance, just bump our health up a bit. Alright, onward. Now this, by the way, is the full zoom out with White Morning. It's of questionable utility since it doesn't actually expand your sight distance, but it's still nice to click further ahead in an environment like this. Anyway, I'm wondering whether we witnessed some kind of four-dimensional chess or something. If he really thinks he can win a war with Wild Pines, why is he just telling us about it? Why even hint at the drug trade? And even if it was peanuts compared to the power of socialism unleashed, why would he just drop it on a whim? Like I said before, he acts all buddy-buddy, but then transparently tries to manipulate, extort, and outright bribe the protagonist, basically trying to act like a shifty businessman at the core. He pretty much ignores Kim, believes his plan is too far along to be stopped, and was practically insisting we tell Joyce everything. Classic villain mistakes, and possibly hubris, sure, but very little in this game is played out the way I expected. 
and Everard just doesn't strike me as an idiot. No, we're missing something here. He didn't set all this up to risk us spoiling things. Unless telling us everything is no risk at all. Or he didn't tell us everything. Just gonna drop the stuffed bird off of guard here. Can I help you? Here you go, man. Sorry about the whole bird thing. Nah, I've been going through a lot. My wife left me. My brain's telling me to put alcohol up my ass. You know what? Forget I said anything. Water under the bridge, right? Aw, oh, empathy says he likes it. Even if it's a rather odd gift. Endurance is all about getting those steps in. Or giving us a heart attack, one of the two. Kim's happy. Gart's happy. We got experience, so we're happy. All is good again. That other bird was totally giving me shit, though. Anyway, come on, Kim. Let us continue. So, to get back to Everard for a sec, I do think he was being somewhat genuine. There's a real anger at Joyce and Wild Pines, a real despair for the state of Martinez, and I think he even genuinely believes some of what he's selling. But he's not an idiot. He has to know that telling us this doesn't make him seem trustworthy. Like with the Hardy Boys, it seems like he wants us to suspect him, and he seems fine with us playing telephone between him and Joyce. No, we're already in the middle of a police pitching match. If he wants his war, he can get off his ass and declare it himself. We got our statements from each side, we got a lead on our gun. We're here to solve a mystery, unfuck our life, and stop a massacre. Not personally settle all the politics of Revishol. With that matter dealt with for now, our leads all point up the peninsula. So let's push further and see what's out there. Everett's right about one thing. It is a bit of a wasteland out here. Oh, give me time. Don't underestimate the power of disco and medical grade alcohol. Pills you find in the field are almost as good as what you find in the bathroom. It's like Fallout. You find a hundred year old stim pack, jam the needle in your arm, you're good to go. Ah, some people up in the boardwalk. And some guys camping or something. Place is hopping all of a sudden. We'll be back to them, but I'll be exploring the peninsula clockwise. It's a pretty big area. Yoink. We'll put these on later. Get our J.C. Denton on. Hard to imagine people launching boats from out here. Some big buildings in the area, though. There must have been business a lifetime ago. No going further this way. Parking lot. Must have been for the office here. Something up of that wall. Maybe another conceptualization check. Aw, oh, fuck yeah. Floor beer. See, I give Spiral the rest of my beer, and nature provides me with a full one. Truly, the good you do is returned threefold. Physical instrument sizes up the building. It's heavily boarded up, and not for lack of trying by the locals. No way we're getting in, although we get points for the optimism. Nah, probably not in here. And if they are, we'll need a construction crew to get in. Alright, let's check this wall out. Hmm, visual calculus. Bullet holes on the wall. Lots of them. Kim chalks it up to automatic rifles. Bit out of reach for gangs and martinets. Sounds more military, if anything. For some reason, we just keep nodding our heads. Now I'm shaking and he's nodding. This is turning into a Seinfeld routine. Right, not sure what the point of that was. But seems like we got a good chance of passing this check, so... Voila. Yeah, it is military. 
We're looking at the results of a firing squad long ago. Not sure if these are just visual placeholders or what their uniforms actually were, based on who Hobocop thinks was doing the shooting. It's been an age since this happened. Only the holes remain now. VC thinks either a lot of firing squads happened here, or the soldiers weren't using mostly blanks, what they call conscience rounds, to make it unclear who fired the real bullet. The victims were ragged and worn down from fighting, likely shot standing. There's no way to know more about them. Esprit de corps thinks they were ordinary people, the kind that always suffer in these things. Empathy thinks they were praying and screaming. Wants us to think about that. Likewise, there's no telling who the soldiers belong to, nor the officer on the side. Kim doesn't know either, but the holes are old enough to date back to the revolution. Maybe the communists put the loyalists against the wall, or the coalition putting down the revolution later. It might have even been a mass execution of private workers. The communists took over the Feld building further down the coast at one point. Probably not the coalition unless they were the ones given the order to fire. It's all history now. Nothing to do but move on. Back to our comparatively pleasant task of poking around a swamp trying to find a murderer. Gentlemen, pardon me while I rifle through your campsite. Ah, tiny cages. These must be the nicer people we're looking for. Looks like the land ends here. We'll have to go around. Don't mind me, sir. Just standing right in your face here. Inland Empire sees a hiding place in the reeds. For what? Just an old buoy in the water. Maybe he's just jumping at shadows again. Well, nothing else there. Let's talk to these guys, see what's going on. Here we go. Nice and easy. No way out, little guys. Not out of this jam. Aha, uh -huh. our cryptozoologists. Who's there? Oh, the police. Hello, officer. Dr. Morell, I presume. Is that the police? Why's the police here? Don't worry, Gary. I'll handle it. But you what do I owe the pleasure? Not a fan of the cops, but what else is new? Ah, of course. Thank you for passing along the message. That damn waterlock is broken, and we can't go all the way around the 881. Oh, good. We should really be getting back. Gary could use a hot shower and a warm bed. Did he say we can go back now? Yes, Gary. We can go soon. If you see Lena, tell her I won't be long. Sir, your wife is waiting for you. I just have to do one more round. See if the Phasmid has taken the bait. Then we're going. You'll note I didn't feel compelled to tell the whole story about the waterlock. I mean, it's not like I remember jumping in the car I wrecked, right? I say let's not confuse the issue with this talk of responsibility. Speaking of responsibility, our good scientist has not seen our suspect out this way. Him and his assistant have been buried in their work for days. Their work being to try and find what they're calling a phasmid, a kind of rare insect that can blend in with the reeds around here, making it difficult to find. Ever the anti-skeptic, Inland Empire believes there's something special about this thing which I'll remind you hasn't been proven to exist. That's what cryptids are. That said, he's expecting it to be pretty big for a stick bug, which you would think would complicate its ability to hide out here. He called it the Insulindian Phasmid, so if they've got a name for it, then these accounts must have some facts in common. 
he does seem pretty sure it exists. But Rhetoric has a hunch there's more to it than just the pursuit of science. He tries to recover, but there's a clear passion for the subject. Empathy does what it does best, recognizing that he's basically looking for phantoms. He claims that a pair of teenagers sighted the thing recently, and described something that resembled what he's looking for. Doesn't answer what it would be doing here, but apparently he thought it was worth following up on. Uh, yeah, can you dumb that down a little? Oh, so these things can go Jurassic Park on us. Fantastic. Actually, I think that's something else entirely. Still, clever girl. So he's setting traps in the thin hope of catching something unique in them. Oh, Lena made the traps. Nice. She did seem to share his enthusiasm for the work. This whole cryptid hunt thing has a lot of dialogue to it, and you'll see in a bit we offer to check the traps for him so he can head back earlier. I mentioned before that I talked to Lena off-camera about cryptids and had a weird thought bubble outside the bar afterward. It basically let me think that I heard one of the critters she described and unlocked the thought for the cabinet to go with it. It sounded like nonsense, and the impression I get is this is more about Lena and Morel's relationship than actually finding this thing. Not that I'm going to tell him then, obviously. It reminds me we haven't actually seen much in the way of animal life in this world. Insects, seagulls, the bear for the fridge. The impression I get is basically Earth, but weirder and not fully specified ways, like the pale. He mentions that he won't let Lena down. I'm thinking this is as much for her as for him. Yeah, empathy feels the same. Lena wants to find this thing, too. And now we see why. She's one of the only people to have seen this thing in the last century. Appears to be how they met, actually, which I thought she said it was through a dating agency. Maybe that was their common interest. Yeah, we'll ask her about that when we get back. He still needs to check the traps before he can head back, of course. Which is where we and our insatiable thirst for side quests come in. I mean, we're already out here in the muck, poking through every corner of the peninsula. No harm in doing this while we're out here. Ah, I should have picked the Chaos line, that's so good. Yeah, my next playthrough I'm going full on Psychic Cop, whose quote-unquote visions might just be hallucinations from all the speed he's doing. Other than the trap they just set, there's one nearby where we just were, and another at Land's End, which we'll be checking anyway as we track down Ruby. Not sincerely expecting to find this thing, either in the traps or the wild, but no harm in being thorough. Thankfully, he's got some reverse bug spray or something, so if we do somehow bump into this thing, it's not going to run off. Certainly not going to help with our smell, but when has that ever stopped us from doing stuff? Kim isn't terribly impressed by this. Come on, where's your sense of adventure? It can't be worse than performing an autopsy, or literally rooting around in garbage. Yeah, I know he's doing this for Lena, but I think she'll just be glad to have him back. Things are getting less tense around downtown, that's for sure. The thoughts are just letting us know to ask our questions now before they leave. We should definitely talk to that other guy before they do. Aha, uh -huh, the armor thought's ready. This'll be interesting. Morel has long since put away his childish things and seems pretty committed to the science of what he's doing. I mean, credit where it's due, he seems like he's taking a reasonable approach to the subject. Like all scientists, he's doing his due diligence and essentially hoping for a surprise, but not expecting one. Pain Threshold is not a fan of surprises, incidentally.
He's yet to ever catch a cryptid, at which point it would probably cease to be a cryptid. The close call might be something to ask about later. Yeah, he flat out admits most of this research ends in failure. There's a professional list of about 4,000 or so cryptids, about half of which are confirmed hoaxes, and only two of the other half confirmed to exist. This more or less matches the study of cryptids in real life. You've got maybe a handful that get proven to exist, usually as some rare offshoot of some existing critter. The rest range from local folklore to tabloid photos of Bigfoot. If you want a game that explores this a bit, Neo Scavenger actually draws upon creatures popularly claimed to exist around Michigan. Dogmen, Melonheads, the Enfield Monster. Most of the focus is on the hardcore survival elements, but there's some smart lore and world building, with the world suffering a kind of shadow runny, myths become real event. It's a really good game. Looking forward to Astronauts, which is set in the same universe. <laughs> Now, let's see what we've learned about the armor. Keeping in mind this is state-of-the-art gear, basically invulnerable to civilian firearms, we've come up with a genius plan of shoot the parts that don't have armor on them. Good plan, Chief. This does give us a big bonus to hit the mercs if we have to fight them, which will be useful once we get our goddamn gun back. Just gonna throw a point in Encyclopedia. We're starting to miss a few of these checks here. Alright, let's see what's up with this guy they keep calling a crypto-fascist. Hello, I'm Gary. Very generous of you to help us out, officer. Yellow man. I, I mean, officer. Really, dude? That's what you're starting with? I'm just waiting for my friend Morel to finish up with his insect traps so we can return to civilization. I like nature, just not this bloody coast. It's mostly drunks and degenerates that come here. Oh, I've been tempted, but someone has to stay strong for Rivercall. Notice there wasn't a no opinion option there. Lord, but authority has issues. He's not wrong about this guy, but first I want to call attention to the audio when he was calling over to Morel versus Close Up. It's not quite what you'd expect from being outdoors. It was a very tight echo, more like he was shouting through a pipe or something. But getting back on topic, this squirrely little fella is Morel's assistant, but not so much a scientist himself. While crypto-fascist conjures up images of a hardcore Bitcoin enthusiast, he really does struggle to keep his nationalism in check for more than a sentence or two. He seems glad to have the RCM investigating, but claims he knows nothing about the mercenary. Composure picks up on some discomfort, however. I swore this goddamn mug was going to come up at some point. And wouldn't you know it, we seem to have found the owner. Yeah, yeah, come on man, spit it out and save us all some time here. That's better. Now, we've got better things to do than bicker about garbage laws. Though apparently, we can fine him for this. And don't get me wrong, he's a racist twerp, but that still feels a little petty. And I feel like Kim wouldn't actually approve of this. Although, if he keeps dropping slurs like that, all bets are off. Anyway, we've got him off balance now, so let's keep him talking. He had access to the trash bin, apparently because someone with trash pickup gave him a key. As it turns out, he dumps his stuff in the Whirling's bin because garbage pickup is expensive and everything bad is some foreigner's fault. Right, got it. Kim is testing him. It's not really about the trash, it's what else he might have done with it. Namely, dispose of the victim's clothes. Turns out he lives across the way from where he was hanged. Kim called this when we broke into that apartment for Everard, which apparently was Gary's all along. The owner is a neat freak. He was going to toss out the mug and took the time to get rid of the clothes, which were lying all over the place. Civic duty, huh? Now what the hell was that? Something went clink when he moved. 
Perception says we've heard this before. Almost like he's hiding something under his shirt. Something, perhaps, taken from the crime scene. Something he didn't put in the garbage. He's playing it cool, but composure isn't buying it. Remember that skill also governs how well you wear something. Yeah, Half-Light knows this isn't over yet. Composure can help us expose the obvious here, but let's see if we can improve those odds, rattle him a bit more. <laughs> well played, Gim. Yeah, after Measurehead and the Lorry Man, we found our lucky third racist. Here's my wish. Give me better odds on proving that you're hiding something under your coat. Those odds aren't better. You're shit at being a lucky racist. Here, how about this one? You said you live in the yard where it happened, right? A certain apartment that a certain union boss wanted us to open, maybe? Now we're seeing some panic. Yeah, he's scared to death of Everard. And considering he probably doesn't know the real story of the murder, he probably believes the Hardys would string him up next if sufficiently motivated. I'm still unclear what he did to get on Everard's shit list. He mentions talking a bit too loudly at the Whirling, some theories that would have to involve the Union somehow, but we move on before we can really elaborate. Kim is clearly enjoying this. Yeah, that's more like it. Now we really shake him down. Composure can see his jacket straining to fit around something, and I suspect he's not about to hulk out on us. Though perhaps a bullet fired at his chest might still bounce right off. And there we have it. Gary here helped himself to a piece of the armor while he was tidying up the yard. Surprisingly, Empathy believes he's actually ashamed of himself. Just start talking, pal. Trust me, Kim's the good cop here, and even he's losing his patience. Imagine how I'm doing. So basically, everybody was looting the body, and he just took his share. He was actually cleaning up the yard while throwing his trash out, saw the armor still on him, and got greedy. Apparently, the mercenary being a foreigner made it easier. Hard to say whether he's genuinely sorry or just sorry he got caught, but we're really not dealing with some hardened bad guy here. Yeah, Kim's easing up the pressure now. We made our point, don't fuck with a crime scene, and it's just a loose end relative to the murder itself. And actually there's an interesting detail here. He talks about Seolite officers in the time of the Scissor Rain, and you can kinda see where that little nugget of belief can calcify and spread over time. Like a lot of bad beliefs, it's mental shorthand because the world is complicated and scary, and the other makes a useful scapegoat. Tell you what, as long as you're getting stuff off your chest, how about you throw in the armor and we just forget this ever happened, okay? And like that, we got two pieces in the same day. We're just dabbing on mystery today. Yeah, yeah, we're done here. Go help pack things up. That said, now that he's taken the moral blame for looting the corpse, I can wear the armor relatively guilt-free. Morality has loopholes, it would seem. Notably, apart from the protection and some nice bonuses, it fits under our coat. With the pinball jacket, you can only just tell, which is kind of cool, actually. We'll leave the dress shirt on for now, but I feel like this especially is going to be useful if we do end up fighting the mercenaries. Just racking up the points today. Feeling like logic and encyclopedia are coming up a lot more. Going to give the former a bump this time. Anyway, let's carry on. Still a lot of ground to cover. The nearest of Morel's traps is around here somewhere. Ah, there it is. 
Mr. Phasmid, you wouldn't happen to be in this trap, would you? It'd make Inland Empire's day. To no one's surprise, it is not. Yeah, Kim's not expecting anything either. Just think of this as cardio, my dude. We're not young men anymore. Actually, how old is Kim? I don't think it's ever come up. Well, one down, anyway. Onward! We shall explore this peninsula, one trivial side quest at a time. Oh, that's right. There's that guy with his kid up there. Fun place to bring the family, I'm sure. Sit tight, son. Daddy's gotta tag this wall. But why, Dad? Because he's having a midlife crisis. Now hand me the spray paint and watch for the cops. Always grab the money first. I don't make the rules. Alright, buddy. You got a permit for that child? And me, Kyle. Notice the windows. Especially with how there are no windows on the south side. This was to deal with... You, officers, come to investigate the historic subtext of West Martinet. I'm Trant Heidelstad. You must be Kim Kitsuragi, right? I was just telling my son about this building. Not a lot of people realize the historic significance here. Very rich in hypertext. Nice to meet you. Hey, hold up. You know Kim? What's going on here? No, I can't say that we've met before, but I've heard of Kim, of course. Mikhail, say hi to the officers. Mikhail's a little tired today. We spent all night trying to run Orbis on his radio computer. Have you heard of it? It's a programming language used in Grad. Quite tricky, but he wanted to play this Grad-made adventure program. We've been getting, really, into worms lately. But I assume you're not here for giant worms, when there are so many real things to see. Just as I was telling Mikhail before, this is where the Coalition landed in 08. We could be standing on what is the most interesting landmark in Revachal West. Esprit de corps thinks we're related for some reason. Calls him a half-brother. Let's not get distracted by trivia, though. If he's familiar with Kim, well, he wouldn't be the first fellow officer to be spying on us. Although what in God's name he's doing out here with his kid is beyond me. His choice of words is telling. This one. If he's police, then he knows about the case. Empathy picks up something familiar in how he says that. A day off. Yeah, this guy almost certainly knows who we are. Anyway, he's talking about the building we're standing in front of, Feld Electrical. Okay, you knew the history of some computer language, but you need help with what R&D stands for? You have failed me for the last time, Encyclopedia. Hang my head in shame. Huh, apparently it is an outdated term. What they use now is RTD, Research and Technological Development. Okay, shame withdrawn. We'll feel it for something else before long, I'm sure. Ah, it's time for a history lesson with random guy in the street who's probably an undercover cop. I mean, as you know, if you ask someone if they're a cop, they have to say the truth. Problem is, the game won't let me. See, that's how they get you. While this conversation isn't terribly relevant to our investigation, it does shed more light on the level of technology in the world. He's saying Feld Electrical was building a prototype for a tape computer before the revolution, which, the way he describes the device, would about line up with where computers were in the 70s. Back in the Doom commercial area, we saw the radio computer, which is technically newer, but closer to 40s and 50s tech, like things have stagnated or even regressed in the years since. The point, or one point, of all this is to again show that this world doesn't quite neatly line up with ours, though it is still human beings, human politics, and human technology. There are parallels, and thus applicability, to our world, even if they only go so far. The Pale, for instance, is an ecological barrier we don't have, and it complicates things like transatlantic cables and land and sea exploration. There's another point to this conversation, and it's in contrast to the firing squad reconstruction we saw earlier. Feld relocated to Revachol and built this area up to encourage employees to move here. When the revolution came, Feld's assets were seized by the new government, and much of the area was destroyed in the war. It's implied that the workers were ultimately executed by the communists, and that might have been what we saw along the wall, though it could also have been the revolutionaries being put down themselves just a few years later.
The seized prototypes were used for military and press releases, including, eventually, the March Degree, a formal statement by the new government to the rest of the world. Encyclopedia says it was their legislative foundation, probably their equivalent of a constitution. I'm trying to think of a modern parallel and coming up short. A lot of the big examples of this kind of homegrown revolution are before the era of mass communication, whereas earlier he said Feld was in the electronics business for at least 200 years. In any case, some of the basics are known, but nobody knows exactly how these things worked anymore, considering the prototypes are gone and the engineers dealt with. And we're going to stop the history and politics talk to recognize the words Wompty Dompty Dom Center. Just try and imagine... Yeah, these thoughts get it. Imagine the mental record scratch in my brain when I first read that. Just blah blah, history, politics, computers, Wompty Dompty, wait, what now? Like, that sounds like an S&M club run by Oompa Loompas or something. Don't give me that look. I had to suffer that thought and by God I will not suffer it alone. Apparently it is a very real thing, an arts and tech exhibition space in Vrida Fort, which I'll remind you is where a mercenary was trained. For some reason, that gives us a thought about the center. I've had enough thinking about it, thank you. Frankly, I'm starting to look more fondly on Fuck the World and Piss uh, that other guy. Anyway, the short of the long story is the invention was swallowed up by the revolution and reduced to just another historical footnote. He sympathizes with the revolutionaries, but laments that it was destroyed. The subtext might as well be text. While the game's politics are rightly critical of the coalition and moralism, there are costs to revolution, both tangible and intellectual. Well, thanks for the lesson, I guess. For some reason, he's thanking us. Rhetoric is confused, as am I. What a peculiar one-off conversation with some totally not a cop that I will never see again. Yeah, not sure what to make of this thought. Just gonna save that point for now. Let's see if we can see anything through the windows. Not much, it seems. And it looks like there's not much to see. Place is crumbling and dark. Kim can't see anything, period. Apparently one of his old partners did most of the seeing for him. Empathy detects some sadness in his voice. The partner, Eyes, is gone. And whatever happened, it was bad enough that he won't talk about it. Fortunately, he trains enough that he's still not a bad shot. Which is good, considering he's the only one of us that has a gun right now. Makes me wonder, since getting your gun is optional, how later confrontations might go if you never do. Do you find other ways to deal with the problem, or just take more damage or something? I, I really want to see where this is all going. Just junk left around the fish market. Although... Aha, uh -huh, a jacket. Ugh, nasty as hell though. It's been sitting out here for a while. Hate to say it, but this might be Idiot Doom Spiral's jacket. Kim, you uh, got any more of those evidence bags? Something big enough for this? For some reason, I can take a closer look at this thing, so of course I'm going to. It's a thing you can poke in an adventure game. You gotta try at least once. Or maybe not. Jesus Christ, this thing. Composure's trying to protect us here. Yeah, let's abort this and just give it to Spiral, without touching it any more than we have to. Looks like there's not much else here. Place is pretty badly run down. Some vagrants have tried to set up shop here. Obviously it didn't last. Hell, Spiral and the guys probably hung out here at some point.
Ooh, moonshine. Pity they didn't leave samples. Huh, there's a guy up there. What's this about? Perception picks up a smell. Awful and familiar. Ah, oh, shit. The smell of death. And if we can pick it up from here... Well, I don't think that guy's gonna have much to tell us. Floorboards are unsteady. Looks like a few have already given way. When approaching a body, always check the garbage first. And actually, it might be relevant here. An assortment of hard liquor bottles and beer cans. Already starting to guess what might have happened here. The rest isn't as telling. Assuming the trash is his, he was out here smoking and eating. VC thinks the kebab's only a couple days old. We'll keep that in mind. Strong winds up here. This place is a death trap. Aw, not Frank Zappa. You went too soon, old friend. Looks like his foot went through one of the boards and he banged his head on the bench. Kinda shocked he didn't fall through entirely. Kim takes a closer look. Seems like this guy's only been out here for a couple days, just like the kebab and the trash. Authority and composure help calm us down. Time to go to work in the shit factory. The kebab was definitely his, so yeah, no more than two days out here. Composure thinks the jacket is custom made. There's a library card in his pocket, should help us identify him at least. Yeah, took a tumble through the board and hit his head on the way down. Logic thinks it might have been dark when it happened, as if it wasn't dangerous enough up here. He certainly looks like he died in a state of shock. Visual Calculus gets a heightened build, somewhere between 50 and 60 years old. Empathy and Inland Empire paint the rest of the picture. He was alone and confused, a working man who was about to head home for the night. Not seeing any sign of foul play. There's a gum wrapper in his fist, though. Hmm. The wound on his head matches the point of impact, where he came out of himself, drop by drop, while unconscious. He was dead in minutes. I don't see any other injuries, though that doesn't mean there aren't any. Everything else is pointing to a horrible accident, though. VC makes the same point I did. He could easily have gone all the way through and fallen into the water, ended up God knows where. The vodka bottles of a piece with the rest of them. Our man was drinking. Hard. He just popped a piece of gum, too. Nearly the whole pack, like he was trying to cover up the smell. Yeah, Kim knows what we're dealing with. Guy was trying to hide his drinking, probably from his wife or kids. He's seen this exact thing before, right down to the gum. He seems to think the guy lives around here somewhere. Not much reason to come out on the boardwalk otherwise. Inland Empire thinks it's a warning for our protagonist. And for once, I think it's right. There it is. He's wearing a wedding ring. Something else we might have in common, or once had. Yeah, I think we can say this is what it looks like. It's possible the health from his alcoholism contributed to the fall, made it harder to see or think clearly, but absent the bench, he'd probably still be alive. Yeah, just another detail. Sometimes a kebab is just a kebab.
So we've got a choice here. The clock's ticking, but we did find the body. It's our case if we think we can handle it, or we can just call it in. No need for a field autopsy if we don't suspect any intent. Not everybody is going to have a complicated story behind it. Just a question of identifying who he was. Yeah, we'll sort this out. The card we picked up should tell us. Sorry, friend. Now, let's take a look here. So it's from Jamrock Public Library. That points toward being a local. Ah, here we go. Billy Mijin. Or, it's French, so Mijon, probably? Logic reminds us it's a unisex name, so Billy could be the deceased or a spouse. Looks like Billy does a lot of reading. I think some of these are actually on sale in the bookstore. I'll have to run through there again, see if there's anything worth picking up. Hey, here we go. A phone number for the library. Plenty of time to call. Yeah, we'll call from Kim's car. Though I wonder if you even could call from pay phones, like in the union office. You know, if Kim was bringing back the body or something. That should be enough to go on. Let's get moving. Still only three in the afternoon. Got another seven hours before a meeting. Might need a way to pass the time, depending on how long it takes to search the rest of the area. Speaking of payphones, I realize this is the other one that was mentioned. The only working phone in Martinez besides the union office. I guess that answers my question. The only option is to dial randomly. Maybe hoping muscle memory kicks in and we call someone we know, that kind of thing. Man, everything around here is just beat up and old, like us. I still haven't gotten a sense for where Ruby might be hiding, or the shooter for that matter. Oop, something in the ground. An opening in concrete. Maybe a sewer? Anybody home down there? Maybe it's just VC pointing out random stuff again. There is a storm drain system down there. Kim says it's badly broken down, but that would be an ideal place to hide. Unfortunately, that doesn't narrow down our search any. That Trant guy talked about the Phil building a lot, so that might be important, but I didn't see a way in. And then there's the church and the bunker that Isabel mentioned. I don't know. We'll just have to keep our eyes open. Keep looking. Long as we're heading back, let's drop off Doom Spiral's jacket. Tequila Sunset. Spiral, brother in homelessness. Got something for you. Hope you don't mind a fixer-upper. I mean, I'm sorry it's not as nice as the day you stole it, but still. It would seem beggars can indeed be choosers. Though really, he's the one giving the orders here. I'm hauling this nasty thing around for him. Who is the servant, and who is the master? Kim notes that it's stain-resistant, might just need to be washed thoroughly, to be sure. Alright, well, maybe we can find a washing machine, or... Oh, hey, the solution's right in front of me, isn't it? Our tenant, the policeman. I hope the waves don't keep you up at night. What can I help you with? Yay, simple solutions to simple problems. Yeah, that's fine. We got time to kill anyway. Gotta keep up with your cardio, Kim. Establish dominance over your body. Handle your pain the hobo cop way by downing some gin and punching your Charlie horse going, Yeah, now who's bad? All squeaky clean now. Thanks, Isabel. I feel like I should have paid her. Game didn't give me the option there. Right, once again. Spiral, brother in homelessness. Michaela Sunset. Here you go, my man. She's all cleaned up for you. He seems to be struggling with this. This is not encouraging. So either he's just picky about the brand, this isn't his jacket, 
or he doesn't remember ever having it. Logic and electrochemistry both think it's the latter. It wouldn't surprise me, this is Idiot Doom Spiral we're talking about. I mean, it's not actually his anyway, but eh, just take the damn thing, man. Call it Tequila Sunset's way of saying thanks. Bit funky getting around some of these maps. That is a minor but persistent issue, and you see it a bit more away from downtown. It's not always clear which parts of the ground you can actually pass through. Anyhow, we'll be wrapping this up shortly. I just want to put the call in about the body first. I'm honestly not sure where we're going to find Ruby, or where the shot came from. Assuming it is a sniper, which we still can't be sure about. There aren't that many places left above ground to search, so either she's holed up in the church, we go underground at some point, or we go to those island ruins we highlighted a couple episodes back, B Triple Prime. Well, let's call it in. Alice! My favorite voice on the radio that, sadly, doesn't get a voice. I kind of selected this on accident. I was going to report the body first. I'm not sure it's a huge difference. You'll see in a minute that's not really acknowledged. Empathy can tell the librarian's worried. It's never a happy feeling when someone says the police are on the phone. Address will do. Almost nobody in Martinez actually has a phone. Capeside Apartments, number 20. That's up across from the apartment we broke into, where our smoker friend lives. Trying to confirm whether Billy is the deceased or his wife. Sounds like they were at the library just a few days ago. There we go, Billy's the wife. Bit of an oddity here. Logic says we have a name, but we don't actually have the husband's name. And unfortunately, the staff only know his face. Yeah, he sometimes drops off books for her and stops the drink on the way home. That last line seals it. He was already a couple bottles in when he went to the library. Christ. Right. Well, at least we know who Billy is. We'll have to visit her to identify the body. That'll be a cheery conversation. Just call in to let Alice know what's going on. Just another day at the office. Yeah, she basically acts like we haven't called the library already. Ah, well. That's all. Thanks, Alice. Alright, that about wraps it up. So, we didn't make much plot progress, but we checked off a couple side quests, got a sense of the big picture with Everard, shook up a fascist, and gave a nice drunk a medium concept windbreaker. Not a bad day's work. Next time, we'll sort out this body business, get back on the hunt, maybe see what's going on with that church. Until then, thanks everyone for tuning in. I'll see you next time.